Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. What are some of the ways that we can recognize a spirit of humility and are a spirit of pride? Just like I quickly this morning recognized a spirit of humility in the pastor that I spoke with, if you learn about pride and humility, you can learn how to recognize it in yourself and you can learn how to recognize it in other people. Now, trust me, we've all got it. And probably a whole lot more of it than we'd like to think that we do. But we can keep growing in this area and we can keep learning. First of all, the humble have no problem asking for help. They'll say, God, help me. <laughs> and they'll ask people for help when they need help. Some leaders get themselves in so much trouble because they cannot let anybody else do anything. Because after all, nobody could do it as right as they would do it right or as good as they would do it. They destroy themselves trying to do everything because they're convinced that nobody could do it as good as they could do it. I not only had to learn to let other people do things, I had to learn to let them do things their way. You know, Saul finally agreed to let David go to try to kill Goliath, but at first he said, you, t you put my armor on. And that's what we do a lot of people, with, a lot of times with people under us. We're like, well, I'm going to give you this responsibility, but you're going to do it my way. Well, David was not able to do it with Saul's armor on because God gives each of us a little different way of going about things. And what we have to be more concerned with is the outcome. And if you get the right outcome, then you don't need to give direction to every little thing that happens. Let people have some liberty. I said, let people have some freedom and some liberty. Make them think you trust them. Amen. John 15 tells us what our attitude should be. Apart from you, we can do nothing. We're like a branch on a vine. Everything that we need to sustain life comes from the vine, and all the branch does is hang there. Just totally dependent on the vine. That's what humility is. It's dependent on another. How many of you recognize that the problem that we have in the world today is from this independent, humanistic attitude? It is the world's number one problem. I cannot for the life of me figure out why people want to get rid of God. I just don't get it. Well, but on the other hand, I do because they think in their pride that they can run their own lives and that they don't need any direction or any governing. And all they have to do is look at the results of trying to run their own life and it becomes pretty obvious, pretty quick, that they're not doing such a good job. Why do we need panels of experts to try to figure out what is wrong with the world? It's very obvious. Stop trying to get rid of God. He's not going away. Amen? People want to be self-governed. They don't want anybody to tell them what to do. Now, I know part of this rebellious attitude that has been going on for a long time is because many people have been mistreated in the past. An authority that they have had has not treated them right, so they come to the point where they don't want any authority. And I realize that that's a problem, but we cannot let our pain from the past become an excuse to permanently disobey God. I was abused by my father, and I had an attitude toward men that would not quit. I had an attitude that no man was going to tell me what to do. Well, you know what? I found it impossible to have a good godly marriage with that attitude. Good morning. I said, I found it impossible to have a good godly marriage with that attitude. Now, God has made men and women to function together as a team. Women were not taken out of the bottom of men's feet. They were taken out of his side to walk beside him, not beneath him. 
But everything still has to have an order. God doesn't just want to boss us around for the sake of bossing us around. But everything in the world has to have an order. Even in the Godhead, there's an order. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Everything the Holy Spirit does is done to glorify the Son. Everything the Son does is to glorify the Father. And then because of that attitude, the Father takes care of everything, and they all become one and share in the glory. We have to learn how to realize that not everybody is the same. I had several men that mistreated me, and then I tried to take that out on the one who was trying to be good to me. We do that so often. It's like we try to make somebody else pay for what somebody back here did to us, and then they can't figure out what's wrong with us because they're just trying to love us and have a good relationship with us. So stop using your past as an excuse to be rebellious. I understand we're all afraid of being hurt. And I can't promise you that you won't be hurt. I can't promise you if you take a more submissive attitude that somebody won't mistreat you or use you. But I can promise you this. God is your vindicator. And he is your recompense. And if you keep your trust in God, nobody is going to mistreat you for very long and get by with it. God will give you a double reward. Amen? Jesus said that he did nothing independently by himself of his own accord. Let's look at John chapter 5, verse 30, because it's just... Beautiful. Lord, I remember how many times I had to stare at this scripture when I was trying to get a little bit of humility. Trying so hard to be willing to come under authority and not go running off and doing my own thing. Has anybody else here ever had that temptation to just run off and do your own thing? I want you to look at the words to this in the Amplified Bible in John chapter 530 on the screen. Jesus said, I am able to, to, to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I'm taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge, I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision and my judgment is right, just, and righteous because, now get this, I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and the pleasure of the Father who sent me. Anybody else here who needs to read that maybe every morning for about the next five years? Amen. Amen. A humble person is very careful not to hurt other people. They're not harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing, but they're humble, gentle, meek, and lowly. Learn from the things that have been done to you what you should not do to other people. I learned some great lessons in my life by being under leadership that mistreated me. And I hated it at the time, but I think it helped shape me into the person that I am now because I have a reverential fear of mistreating people. And if I do mistreat people, it's because I'm in some way deceived and not realizing that I'm doing it. I know that we cannot purposely go around hurting other people and expect God's anointing and power to be on our lives. We have to be more careful about how we treat people. Can anybody say amen to that? Can anybody over here in the balcony say amen to that? We need to be more careful. Well, see, we want people to be more careful how they treat us. Well, maybe we need to sow more of what we want to reap. Amen. Jesus said, I'm not harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing. You know, one day last week, I got a little bit feisty with Dave. You know, just like any married couple. We've all got habits that can kind of be irritating to the other one. And he got in my space with one of his irritating habits. <laughs> when I didn't want him in my space with one of his irritating habits, I felt like being left alone. I was propped up in bed, and I was watching something, and I was all comfy. And here he comes and parks next to me to fellowship, and he starts with one of his irritate it's just something him and the dog do that just like gets on my nerves and so I'm like I said will you not do that here and then he's like oh it'll be fine I said you just don't care 
if anybody else is comfortable or not, as long as you're comfortable. So then he gets up. He says, okay, I'll go in another room. I don't have to stay here. Well, then the minute he got up and left, then I felt bad, and I thought I should have kept my big mouth shut. And so, any of you ever think that I should have kept my big mouth shut? So then I waited a few minutes, and <laughs> I waited a few minutes, and then I thought, okay, I just might as well go apologize, because the thing that I've learned that I'm going to share with you this morning, too, is a humble person will always be a maker of peace. If you've got any degree of humility, you'll always go the extra mile to make peace with the other person, no matter whose fault it is. You're going to go make peace. So I went out there and I thought, okay, is this going to be hard? Is he going to be mad? Am I going to have to eat dirt or is it going to be easy? <laughs> he said he was waiting for me to come out. And um, Well, the good thing, though, is you see, 20 years ago, it would have taken me three weeks. Now it only takes about three minutes. That's called progress in the Lord, amen? I tell you, at one time, I could have won any contest in how long a woman could stay mad. But anyway, I said, listen, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. I know I was just probably being selfish. And he was so gracious. He said, it's fine. I understand. I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And I just went back to bed and felt so good. Now, I don't know whether he understood or not. Don't care if he did or not, as long as he told me that he did. <laughs> Amen? Maybe sometimes it would just be good for us to tell people that we understand their weirdness, even if we don't. It's like, it's okay, I get it. It's a hormone that went in the wrong direction or something, but it's cool. A humble person is careful how they treat other people. The Bible says in Galatians 6 that we should bear with the failings of the weak. You know what that means? Put up with stuff. Because you know what? There's something in you that people have to put up with too. Oh, I can't believe that. Well, that's because we don't see it. I remember how I used to pray for Dave to change. Oh my gosh, when I learned the power of prayer, did I start using it on Dave? I mean, I would pray vehemently, even pounding my fist on the floor where I was laying spiritually on my face. Oh, God, you got to change Dave. And one day, the voice of the Lord came to me saying, <clears throat> Dave is not the problem. I thought, well, who is? There's only me and him. It can't be me. Do you know what pride does to us? How we can see what's wrong with everybody else and we're very quick to tell them, but we don't see a thing that's wrong with us? Come on. I'm preaching better than you're acting. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 2, that the humble don't pressure people to be perfect. We make allowances for one another. I remember... Years ago, when God said to me, Joyce, you have permission to have weaknesses. I thought, oh, oh my gosh, how good is that? <laughs> That's not that God doesn't want us to work to overcome our faults, but the point is, is every single person has a certain amount of weaknesses assigned to them that you are going to deal with, and you better thank God for them because that's the one thing that may hopefully keep you humble. A humble person thanks God for their strengths, and they trust God in their weaknesses. A humble person is not afraid to recognize their weaknesses, and they're not afraid to share them with other people. Don't always let your testimony be about how you've overcome everything. Let part of your testimony be the stuff you're still dealing with and trying to overcome. Amen? Because then other people can relax with you and open their heart up. I don't like to listen to somebody preach that never tells me anything except their victories. I'm glad you got a victory, but tell me how you got there. And tell me how long it took you to get there. And tell me how many fits you had on the way there. You know, there's been such an uproar over Paul's thorn among the Word and Faith people. 
Paul had this thorn, and you know, some say, well, it wasn't sickness because, you know, blah, 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 blah. Frankly, I don't care what it was. I think we missed the whole point arguing about it. It was given unto me a thorn in my flesh, Paul said. Three times I besought the Lord to deliver me from it. And he did not, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you to enable you to bear the trouble manfully. And Paul said that that thorn was given to him in order to keep him from being excessively exalted because of the greatness of the revelations that God was giving him. God was using Paul in such a great way. He was showing Paul such phenomenal things that he had to also include a little few weaknesses over here, a few things that Paul had a problem with, a few things that Paul couldn't seem to handle properly just to remind Paul that he also had a human side to him and that these great things that were happening through him were God and not him. Amen? So I've got weaknesses. There are things that, you know, I have a tendency to be impatient. I think a lot of leaders are. We want things done right when we want it, the way we want it, five minutes after we say it. And I've come a long, 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 long way and I've still got a long way to go, but I probably will always have to stand against that temptation to get impatient with people who are not doing things the way that I would like it done. Well, you know what? I don't despise myself for that. I don't have a hard time sharing that with you. It's just something to keep reminding me that I need God. Amen? Dave and I talk frequently about where we came from. We still talk several times a year about the early days of the ministry when we were driving a van that had bald tires and rust around the fenders and we'd go out to speak and didn't even have the money to stay in a motel. We'd drive as far as we could get coming back and then have to pull over in a parking lot of some fast food restaurant so Dave could sleep a little bit and we could get home. We looked at some pictures the other day, some old pictures and saw a picture where it was just Dave and I and one guy that was like the whole band. I mean, he sang and played guitar and played piano and played a drum machine with his foot all at the same time. <laughs> I tell you, we were a sight. Our ministry started with 25 people in our living room floor that we ministered to for five years. And then we added another second Bible study to that. And then I went to work for somebody else and I did that five years. And you know, you're not really fit to be in authority till you know how to come under authority. A lot of people don't know how to come under authority. They only want to be in authority. They only want to be the boss. Maybe you don't like where you're at right now, but maybe it's the best place that you need to be. Maybe you haven't been promoted yet to the place that you'd like to be in, but you know what? When God's ready to promote you, He'll promote you. And if He doesn't do it, then you need to thank God that you're still where you're at right now because that means there's still something that God is working in you that's going to be helpful. In the meantime, learn how to treat people right. I believe that a humble person is quick to forgive, difficult to offend, and joyfully waits on vindication from God. I'm going to say it again. The humble are quick to forgive. Matter of fact, I think when we won't forgive, it's a manifestation of pride. Ouch, ouch. I said, I think when we won't forgive, well, yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. Well... Wait, 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 wait. What have you done to God? Well, you, you, don't, you don't know how many times they've done the same thing. Uh, ho hold on, hold on. How many times have you done the same thing? And God's had to forgive you for it over and over and over. Come on, he's not asking us to do anything for anybody else that he's not willing to do for us. That whole story in Matthew 18 about the guy who owed all this money and he couldn't pay so his master forgave him and then the guy who got the forgiveness went out and tried to choke somebody to death over 20 bucks. That's not the way that God wants us to be. The humble person says, but for the grace of God, there go I. The humble person says, I don't have any problem forgiving you because I got all kinds of problems of my own. And maybe we don't do exactly to somebody else what has been done to us, but the point is, is we need to be quick to forgive, 
realizing how much God forgives us for every single day of our lives. The forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, the long-suffering of God, the patience of God is the most beautiful thing in the world. That's what enables us to live with any kind of joy and peace. Amen? His mercy is new every day. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't open a door like that for the devil. But I feel, we already talked about feelings last night. We're going to talk about them some more. You can't go by how you feel. You got to do what the Word says. But I feel, but I feel, but I feel. Let's look at Colossians 3.13. Be gentle and forbearing with one another. And if one has a difference, a grievance, or a complaint against another, readily pardoning each other, even as the Lord has freely forgiven you, so you must also forgive one another. Trust God for your vindication. If somebody's mistreating you, the best thing you can do is forgive them. Go ahead and be friendly with them. I'm not suggesting you let people walk all over you. That's, that's not the point at all. The Bible tells us to pray for our enemies, be good to those who abuse us and mistreat us. In other words, maybe somebody at work lied about you and got the promotion that you thought should have been yours. Now maybe you hear that their car is broken down and they're taking the bus to work. The best thing that you could do to just punch the devil right in the face is to go offer to pick them up every morning. You're not as excited as you ought to be. Well, they don't even live anywhere close to me. I'd have to go out of my way to do that. <laughs> Humble people are peacemakers. They're mature. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the makers and the maintainers of peace, for they shall be called the sons of God. Amen? Not the children of God, the sons of God. When you become a peacemaker, when you're willing to humble yourself, when you're willing to adapt and adjust what you want in order to keep peace, that's maturity. Amen? It took me a long, 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 long time to learn that. Let's look at Philippians 2. Two through five. Fill up and complete my joy by living in harmony and being of the same mind, one in purpose, having the same love, being in full accord and of one harmonious mind and intention. Do nothing from factional motives through contentiousness, strife, selfishness, or for unworthy ends or prompted by conceit and empty arrogance. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, which is lowliness of mind, let each regard the other as better than and superior to himself, thinking more highly of one another than you do of yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to think badly of yourself. It just means that you need to have a good opinion of other people. Let each one of you esteem and look upon and be concerned not merely for his own interests, but also each for the interests of others. We need to care about each other. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. The humble don't think more highly of themselves than they ought to. They're very careful about how they think about themselves in their mind. Romans 12 talks about how we are not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the entire renewal of our mind. Then it says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to, but Think of yourselves according to the grace of God that's given unto each one of you. Then it goes on into a discourse about how different people have different, different gifts and they're all able to function differently according to what God has given them. However we learn these lessons, God will teach them to us one way or the other. You need to know who you are. And you need to be happy for the gifts that God has given you. And you should never be jealous of somebody else's gifts. Nor should you try to compete with them or compare with them. And get yourself in an uproar trying to do something that God has not gifted you to do. However God's going to work through you, He's not going to work through you like He works through somebody else. And I believe pride is involved when we can't get satisfied with what God has given us. And when we have to feel like that we have to do what somebody else is doing, be what they are, look like they look, have what they have, 
We're never going to have any real joy until we get rid of the need to impress one another and we can just be who we are humbly and beautifully before God, thanking Him for what we can do and trusting Him for what we cannot do. Amen? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Well, I actually believe that humility is one of the number one Christian virtues that we should seek. You know, I like to read a good book on humility at least once a year. It just helps me to remember that I'm nothing in myself, but I can be everything in Christ. You know, the Bible talks about confidence, and it says, put no confidence in the flesh. It really gets into an area of pride if I think that I can do it and I don't need any help. But when I lean on God and I'm confident in Him, then I'm free. <laughs>